Uh, hi, everyone. If my laptop crashes during the presentation, it's because I'm actually running test wireless code, and occasionally things crash. So if it does crash, I'll switch over to this thing. This is exactly how much faith I have with my own wireless code at times. Uh, hi, I'm Adrian. I do wireless stuff. If you uh, are on free, any of the FreeBSD mailing lists, you'll occasionally see me whinge about how crap stuff is. It, don't take it personally. I just whine a lot about how broken things are. Um, as a, as a legal disclaimer, this is all stuff that I do myself, and Qualcomm Atheros just gives me fun toys and lets me get away with playing with them. Um, all righty, so what are we talking about today? Uh, what I've been doing, what I and a few others have been doing in the last 12 months, and what I'm planning on doing in the next 12 months uh, based on how much spare time I have. Uh, what's upcoming in a bunch of stuff we already support, so Mesh, TDMA, and all the, the normal operating modes, and what stuff is sneaking up behind us and we either need to implement soon or we should have implemented a while ago. Um, I'll talk briefly about devices and challenges, but the, this is only a one hour slot, so I'm not gonna try and describe everything. There's just a lot to cover. So what actually has been happening? Um, the, the main interesting stuff that I've been working on over the last year or so is focusing on the Atheros devices, mainly because I hate to say it, but there's more out, there's more documentation and source code out there for those things than anything else. And it doesn't hurt to work for the company that makes them. Um, I've been mostly focusing on 11N, but I've been trying very hard not to break any of the previous generation stuff. So I have done some demos at work where I show one laptop with their first gen card and then current gen cards and the same laptop all working and people think I'm really strange. Um, I've also took a little bit of time to make TDMA work on the 11N cards, which was mostly an exercise in figuring out what had changed in the hardware. And, it, and again, that had mostly been, uh, I'll, just, I'll talk about that later. Um, there's been some interesting issues getting PowerSafe support working for host AP mode, which since pretty much everyone else who wants to use wireless these days has some kind of mobile device or laptop with a battery in it, uh, getting PowerSafe, correct PowerSafe handling when trying to act as an access point is pretty important. Otherwise, things just, just blow up. Um, someone asked me to make uh, ad hoc 11N work, so I did. That was another mistake. Um, an interesting, there were a bunch of interesting issues surrounding uh, pa what, what, what we call per packet transmission power control, which is just letting, be able to program the wireless card to transmit uh, individual packets at varying, tra at varying transmit power rates which turns out to be really useful when you're operating in an environment like this hall, where you, you may want to speak to some clients that are close by at low power transmit powers and some clients that are far away at high transmit powers, so you mitigate interference and can so kind of control how, how much interference your access point is and your station is having with adjacent devices. Um, and I've been, since I have had to debug a whole lot of stuff, I've been uh, cluing myself up on how to get uh, device and, and network stack logging working mainly because printf debugging sucks. And trying to, do, trying to do per packet printf debugging is an exercise in hilarity, and I think it's really stupid. So I, re I tried not to not reinvent the wheel, but we don't really have a generic thing that devices can do logging with. We provide the, ba the basic logging framework, which is ALQ and KTR, but nothing really on top of that to let us do interesting things. So I started doing that for, for the Atheros driver. Uh, there have been some work from others, so it hasn't all been me and my sleepless nights. Um, the uh, uh, Montada, who's sitting somewhere there, uh, has been working on fi finishing up the 11S mesh support. So thank you for doing that. I don't have to. It makes me happy that somebody else is taking care of that. Uh, Bernard has been working on bringing, up to, bringing the Intel driver up to date. And there have been some fixes with the RA link and the Realtek drivers, but by and large, most of the other wireless drivers are pretty much un unmaintained. So if you have a non atheros card that works, good for you. I'm, I'm very surprised. The main thing that I was working on this the last 12 months has been to get support for all the latest Atheros 11N cards in there. And what Linux did was they took the internal driver and they hit on it with a big make me a Linux driver stick until it looked but didn't look like the internal driver Right. And, and anyone who's worked on Linux drivers knows what this basically means is you take all the driver source and all these nicely abstracted ways and you just remove all the abstractions and you go, you're a flat driver. In one directory, there are no abstractions, bugger that. Funnily enough, it didn't fix any actual bugs. 
right? It turns out fixing bugs and making it a Linux driver aren't necessarily aligned the same way. So it did mean that they didn't have to deal with all the extra crap surrounding supporting BSD, supporting Lin uh, Windows and Mac OS and VXWorks and arbitrary other operating systems. But what it did mean is that it, whenever they wanted to add support for new chips after that, it wasn't just a case of take the new internal driver and port the changes over. Because as they started making it more Linuxy, they removed the ability to just simply do patch merge. And I come from a different world where I'm really slack, really, really slack. And I don't want to be stuck having to hand cherry pick and hand merge individual fixes when the, the, the amount of changes required for some of these, for some of these wireless chips is actually quite big, right? I, I don't want to be a guy that has to do all the radio stuff and all the baseband stuff and all the calibration stuff and any other bugs that happen to, ha to, 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 to crop up. And any, people who've done hardware, especially people who've played with this stuff, knows shit is buggy. And I don't want to fix any of that. So I took a slightly different route. And what I did was I went through the ridiculous internal process to get legal and engineering approval to open source the HAL code that we ship to. Yay. All right. Now, wait, 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 wait. Now, I'm not the first one to do it because Luis Rodriguez at Atheros got, uh, had, uh, open, uh, got the non-11N stuff open sourced. And Sam Leffler got the 11N stuff open sourced. So, the Atheros driver has actually been using an open HAL for, in FreeBSD has been using an open HAL for a few years now, right? The difference is, is I, didn't I wanted to take something that is as close to what we actually are and going to ship to customers versus some snapshot from six months ago that we've spent all this time trying to put, like, hand carve out all the, all the stuff that we don't want to expose to people and then release it, but it's not actually shipping on anything, primarily because I want to pick up bug fixes from everyone else's work, right? We have hundreds of engineers fixing all these bugs and adding new chipset support, and my bug fix support should be do vendor merge, fix conflicts, grumble at how shit it is, right? But in no, in no way there do I really want to spend my time figuring out which bits to merge to fix a bug. And by and large, it actually seems to be working out quite well, because now that the rest of the, the non-HAL code supports all the crap that I need for the new chips, I can just do merges from the, from the internal code base, stick it on a website, and merge them over into FreeBSD, and it just fixes bugs. So I'm going to keep doing that as long as I can, but the experiment seems to actually work. Um, and the Linux guys are kind of surprised that I managed to pull this off. Um, I don't want to write a new wireless driver from scratch. I, I, as I said, I'm very, very slack. This is different to what everyone else in the, in the, in the Wi-Fi community, at the open source Wi-Fi community, is doing at the moment, because they're all Linux. They're all companies shipping Linux products, and their Linux people are fed up dealing with crappy internal uh, reference drivers that are multi-platform and you know, have to support all this, all this chip bring up and engineering processes and regression testing and Wi-Fi alliance, you know, Wi-Fi certification, you know, all the stuff that actually really matters. That it's too difficult for them to deal with that, and they are used to this code being not necessarily clean, so they tend to make a new driver. And then you have two problems. Right? And, and the, the lot of people who deal with the Linux wireless stuff, there's a lot more support, but it's quite spotty. And trying to keep things up to date is actually a lot of work. So I'm trying, to, I'm trying a different approach, where, as I said, I'm slack as hell. And so how is it actually working out? I wrote all of the initial dry, the glue in the driver itself, ma mainly to do with uh, DMA changes from scratch. Um, and in the process, found a whole bunch of bugs in the reference driver, because it turns out that people wrote the code and they never looked at it. So that was actually kind of nice. Um, and I also found bugs in the Linux driver for this much the same reason. Um, and then the HAL comes from QCA, and all I do to the HAL is I have a great big sed script, an and unif def script, that compiles out all of the stuff mainly to do with um, FPGA bring up. So the HAL that's there is basically the same as what we ship, minus FPGA code, which you guys will never ever need to use. Um, and it works as well uh, as long as the API inside the HAL inside QCA doesn't drift too much from the current API. And so I've been evolving the, the FreeBSD API in, the right, in, in a direction which I think is right. And there are some wrapper functions inside of the HAL in order to make, in order to mitigate the fact that there are some API changes I think are just bogus and they shouldn't have done. Um, and that seems to be working okay, right? I mean, I don't think that the HAL API is going to change all that much. And it also means that we have one wireless driver that supports all of those NICs in that list. Now, some people 
have commented that having a, a non-11n driver in Linux and an 11n driver in Linux means that both drivers can focus on what the driver does best. <clears throat> and I counter that pretty quickly by saying, besides the very first chip and the very second chip, the rest of them look much the same anyway. And to the point where they actually have some of the same bugs, all the way traceable through the different evolutions of that. So it turns out that when they have bugs in, say, interrupt handling in at 9 k they also have to figure out how to fix it in at 5 k in the non-11n driver. And so now they've got three problems. They have the internal driver, and then an 11n driver, and a non-11n driver, which sort of speaks to the hardware that mostly the same way with some extensions, and they end up having to repeat the same work over and over again. And I said, bugger that. This hardware is close enough, looks close enough together to just stick it all in one driver. So it actually works. It actually works really well. I'm kind of surprised. The next thing I did was I got fed up trying to do printf debugging, so I shoehorned a bunch of, uh, of tracing using ALQ and KTR. And what I've done with ALQ is primarily to debug the, the, dis the transmit and receive descriptor handling when, with, when writing said transmit and descriptor handling for the new driver, uh, for the new chips. So I'll, I'll break out of this in a moment and give you a, a, show you what's going on. Oh, actually, I have it in the next slide. Good point. So, the ALQ stuff just you know, lets you shovel a bunch of binary data into a file. And it would be really nice if you could sh shoehorn it into a socket, but that's a different story. And then userland can grab that and read it and do whatever the hell it wants to it. So I have a userland process which parses a bunch of what's effectively TLV structures that I define in the, dri in the, in the, in the driver source that lets me pull out some of this interesting debugging stuff. And I ended up using this to not only debug the initial um, chip bring up for the newer chips, but I used it, I added probes to figure out all of the uh, TDMA logic so I could run TDMA for, for hours at a time and then look at the debug logs to see what the hell was going wrong. And it was really nice being able to do this without using printf. Um, I'd like to eventually merge this with all the other wireless drivers and the wireless stack so I can do things like get per packet traces showing, you know, I received a frame with this sequence number and blah, 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 and then 802.11 decided to drop it, or 802.11 decided to stick it in a power save queue, or, uh, or decided to do blah, or work up blah, in order to be able to do things like, you know, use a phone for half an hour, set up logging to log everything to, to and from that particular phone MAC address, and then do post-processing of that log when things eventually do screw up. Because I'm at the point now where it takes hours or days for things to screw up, and again, doing printf debugging for days is really sucky. Um, so this is the kind of information that I, uh, summary information that I get. Um, this here is showing the interrupts and the transmit descriptor handling, and I actually do print out all of the, the descriptor fields, but for doing timing-related um, discovery, all I really needed here was when did the event happen and what, what was the result. So the left-hand column is just in microseconds. And the, this showed, uh, the, the reason I chose this was to show one of those quirky bugs I found in the driver when I actually went looking. So in this particular instance, TXD says I queued a frame, and interrupt says I got an interrupt, and the interrupt code me, the, the, the relevant bit is t end of transmit list. And then you check the first descriptor on the transmit, uh, the transmit queue, and it's not completed. And so you sit there and you scratch your head going, but the hardware just told me that there's a packet there to, for me to handle. And then I went and go check it, and it's not ready. And then 79 microseconds later, I get another interrupt, this time saying TX is done, and the same descriptor is now magically completed. So I scratch my head and I go, what the hell is going on here? And I wander upstairs, the, the guys who, did the, who, did the, um, who do the Verilog coding, and I say, what the hell? And they're like, oh. So what happens, Adrian, is when the, when the DMA engine hits the end of the list, it signals end of list, and then when it actually finishes transmitting the packet, it send, sends tri transmit done. But it'll hit the end of the list before it finishes transmitting the packet. <laughs> right? And the, 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 the transmit mit interrupt mitigation code in the driver was set up in a way that only ever transmitted, uh, set transmit done interrupts every n packets and relied on when you hit the end of the list to get notified that you have hit the end of the list and process all the interrupts off until that point. So there's this magic subtle race condition where if you're not doing a lot of traffic, you can actually not get notification for a packet being completed or failed until you queue the next packet. Yay, right? And this only shows up when I started doing this debugging and going, why am I seeing crap that I... Sorry? I mean, this is just like all the, all the reasons why you think wireless is quirky is crap like that. 
The next thing was try to figure out what was going on with the um, rate control. So I, I took the, the, the sample rate control module and made it, do, made it do 11N, which was mostly a case of teaching it that, MC, that 11N rates aren't bad, and then doing a little bit of fudging for, for reasons I'm not, there's no need to go into here. But mo mostly the rate control code works. And I, I, I didn't want to go down the path of making an excellent rate control module that handles all situations well, because I want someone else to do that. I have the rate control code doing good enough and the API lets you write new rate control modules to select when, when to transmit to, and, and how to transmit. So my, my task is done, right? Well, I want my task to be done. But again, there's no debugging in this kind of stuff. There's no, there's no way to see what's going on whilst the thing's running. And the only debugging that was there was to type in sysctl and get a kernel printf dump, which again, doing live debugging, if the only debugging method you have is constantly tailing a log file and you know, dumping out all the rate control uh, entries is just really stupid. So I hacked together, again, another um, TLV uh, uh, ioctal interface this time, specifically to dump out all the rate control information for a given station that's associated. And then in user land, I just print that stuff out. And it looks something like this. And the colors are just an indication to, to, to match, like the, the, the cyan is there to match uh, which rates it's probing, and the, the um, purple and the, and, the, and, the, and the blue are there telling me what rates are currently active. And if I, can, if I do a demo quickly, uh, see, if, hopefully I'm on the same AP as I was a few minutes ago. Right, so I've got, I actually have live data, and if I go and piss off the access point a bit. Oh, come on, it's great, right? You don't, guys don't need wireless to work, right? So you can see that the stats are currently live, and if I cover it, is it gonna error out? No, okay, let me do something else. Let me just go. That's because I really hate life now. No, it's, the signal strength is still too good to the access point. But you can see that it's jumping around, and I can actually track what's going on in real time, and I can see what rate it's currently selected, and when it goes up and down, I can see it probe other rates and look at the, 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 um, the, the current error average and watch that go up and down. And it's not that impressive at the moment because it's, it's, 11, it's only associated to an 11A access point. But when you're actually associated to an 11N access point, you're doing a couple of hundred megabits of traffic, crap goes everywhere. And even just slowly moving your laptop around causes the wireless behavior to go cuckoo. So it's actually nice to watch it live rather than tailing a log file. Because as I said, I really fucking hate that. All right. So that's what I've been doing in my nights in 2012 and up to now. So what's going to happen next? Um, I'm going to go into these in a little more detail, but that's basically the list. Um, concurrency and locking needs to be fixed, but that seems to be a constant problem in FreeBSD. That's OK. That means there's, there's always going to be stuff for us to hack on. Um, everyone hates fragmentation, uh, fragmentation at the, at the 802.11 layer, and the, which is separate from the IP layer, mind you. And in 802.11n, you, you don't do fragmentation when you do aggregation. So when you're doing high-speed 11n, there's no packet fragmentation involved. But in order to meet the Wi-Fi um, certification, you still have to support fragmentation handling both transmitting and receiving it when you're doing non-11n. So I have to fix it. At the moment, it's actually broken. Um, and I have to move all, I want to move all of the drivers over to the new model of stuff rather than the, the transmit model in the art, where, rather than the old transmit model, uh, and a bunch of other stuff. Background scanners needed for stations, 11n aggregation for mesh would be nice. Uh, client safe power save support so the NIC goes in and out of actually switching itself on and off in order to save power. Um, and a bunch of stuff that we're actually going to need for 11AC involving regulatory domain and um, rate control extensions. And hopefully, Monthadar uh, handles upgrading some of the mesh support to get it up to the current specification and interoperate with Linux. So I hope that that actually happens. Um, but since it's all being done in my spare time, it all basically is a function of how much sleep I get. And they're in inverse proportion, right? So the more work I do, the more sleep I get. No. Um, the first thing is regulatory. The FCC can be, it's like a bear, right? It sleeps until it's hungry. And then it wakes up and gets very angry at whatever's around it. And, and this, is, this is still obvious now, right? They, there's a bunch of rules for um, uh, like what frequencies you can transmit on and how long you can transmit and how much power you can transmit. And we need to update our infrastructure to support all the crazy rules that every country has. And when Sam did this stuff years and years ago, 
there were only a handful of regulatory domains that encompassed entire continents. And now individual countries have weird variations on what frequencies they have allocated and transmit powers they're allowed to transmit on. So in order to meet compliance for not only FCC, but all the crazy European and stuff in Asia that's going on, we need to up I need to upgrade the regulatory domain handling, mostly to, to set it up so I can actually have a regulatory domain per country rather than 15 hard-coded regulatory domains. Um, the next thing is that, we have, that I'm going to have to add all the new frequency rules for all the odd shit that isn't actually Wi-Fi. So um, people are doing uh, 11 AD in 60 gigahertz for doing PCIe, or PCIe over wireless. Um, and that, look, that starts off looking like 802.11. You actually associate like a station, like two P2P stations, and then you could do Wi-Fi over it. But once you bring that, that up and you've done encryption and you've set up your encryption state, then, you do, then it looks like a hot plug PCIe card. And you speak to some like embedded NVIDIA chip or whatever inside a projector, and it looks like a VGA device. Um, crazy people keep wanting to use the TV spaces for doing Wi-Fi, and let me tell you, Wi-Fi goes really far at 400 megahertz. Really, really far. Now, I haven't done this because I don't have a ham radio license, but now I have an excuse to get a ham radio license. <laughs> I, I, I may own some one watt 420 megahertz cards, and let me tell you, those things are kind of fun. Um, the other thing is 11AC is coming, and they actually have 80 megahertz channels and 160 megahertz channels, and then split 80 and 80 megahertz channels in 5 gig. And so I also have to update the regulatory code to handle the concept of arbitrary channel widths, um, because we also do 5 and 10 megahertz stuff, and some of the vendors like uh, Microtik and um, Ubiquiti have hacks in their drivers to do things like be a three and a half megahertz wide channel. Don't ask me why, it's some crazy ass thing, but that's the kind of crap that people are asking for. Uh, pardon? Uh, no, but this, they were doing this for um, two and five gigs, so they could stack individual subscribers on three and, three, three and a half and two and a half megahertz wide channels, right? But yeah, you're right, for 420 meg, I think they want it to be able to do, to fit inside the old UHF channel allocation scheme. Um, sorry? Well, it's not my problem, right? It's their problem. Um, the other thing is, is that, that the 900 megahertz NICs uh, actually have special regulatory domain entries for them, which is kind of bizarre, but it just happened to be the right way at the time to, f to fudge doing 900 megahertz NICs that are actually two gig NICs that have a down converter glued on them. So I want to try and make that generic so that I actually have 900 megahertz uh, regulatory domain entries for countries that allow um, 900 megahertz operation without a license. And then you have a different way to say, oh, by the way, this NIC is actually a 900 megahertz NIC. Um, so I want to separate those two to make it so that I can be compliant in different countries. Um, the other thing is that up until the white spaces stuff, all the channel representation was done in one megahertz increments, which is fine because that's what it was. But for, white, for the TV stuff, the the channel tuning is now fractional channel, fractional free megahertz. So it's 500 kilohertz or 250 kilohertz uh, increments. And the newer chips that we, that we put out there, well, when I say newer, I mean newer than about six years ago, allow you to tune to arbitrary kilohertz offsets. So people who put down converters down to UHF, they want to be able to tune to like 420.7 blah, right? And so at some point, I'm going to have to modify the channel representation code to do that. And that's a bit of a, a nightmare. Um, the, the next thing is, is we, unfortunately, the, 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 each driver had this own idea of how to do transmission rate control to figure out what, what, what to transmit at like what speed and what options to, to individual stations. And the Atheros driver has a really nice API for doing this, but it's separate from the rest of the stack. So Rui did a bunch of work to do uh, a rate control uh, module interface in Net802.11, but it only does non-11N rates and so if, when it's used for chips that do 11N, there's a whole bunch of like, behind the scenes hand wavery to translate 11N rates to non-11N rates so the rate control code doesn't lose, lose the plot. And so part of what I'm going to do this year is actually treat, uh, upgrade the 802.11 rate control code to do 11N and pr get ready to do 11AC so that I can just use it for all the drivers because I'm kind of fed up having this really nice rate control code in the Theros module that I can't use elsewhere. Um, there are some technical issues with this, which the, the slide goes into. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to do is to tie it into the, the, the packet scheduling path. So instead of the rate control code just being told, yo, I'm transmitting to station X, what should I do? The rate control code should really tie in hand to hand with the, the QoS scheduling code to say, so which station should I transmit to next? 
and then how should I speak to it? Because then it can track how busy the air is and um, whether the station is, is close or far away, whether you can transmit uh, quickly or slowly, and it can make a decision as to you know, how to schedule this stuff in a more efficient way where you don't have the common problem with open source Wi-Fi where one slow client screws everyone else up. Right? Because most of this OPI packet scheduling stuff packet scheduling stuff between stations is done on some kind of FIFO method. And one slow client backs everyone else up because he gets the same, like it gets the same scheduling slice uh, in the same order that everyone else gets. Um, and then there's the whole people forgot to put locking into the 802.11 layer when they unlocked it from giant. So the main problem here is um, that as a generic thing in, in the FreeBSD uh, networking stack, um, the transmit path is as unlocked as possible. So you can have multiple entries from multiple upper layer processors like iPerf or Firefox or Chrome entering the driver transmit layer through the TCP stack all at once. So if you have a thousand TCP sessions and they're all, they're all active at the same time, you can have a thousand concurrent entries assuming you have a thousand cores, you have a thousand entries into your driver at once. And the network stack tries to put the onus on, on queuing between TCP or UDP flows on the driver. It doesn't do any queue discipline itself. It only ensures that when it hands packets off to the driver that inside a TCP or UDP flow, the packet ordering is, is maintained. And for Ethernet drivers, that's okay, because you basically just kick a frame to an Ethernet driver, and the Ethernet driver doesn't really give a crap about which TCP flow gets which packet when. And now the sort of the giggy and tingy people are having to care about that for different reasons. But for Wi-Fi, because I have extra state on top of that, I actually have to care about what order the packets come into the stack and then what order I present them to the wireless card. Because if I get that ordering slightly wrong, the receiver ends up dropping frames because it thinks they're out of order. And it goes, oh, I've already seen this sequence number, so throw it away. Um, and there's a whole bunch of interesting concurrency stuff to do with someone's transmitting and someone's receiving and then someone pulls the reset switch. Or someone's transmitting and someone's receiving and something changes channel. And at the moment, what actually, ha well, what happened last year and the year before was you could be transmitting at the same time that the reset path was changing the channel and then you're currently poking the DMA engine to transmit shit when you're reprogramming the RF synth and it, the, 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 everything's offline while you're trying to do that and then the chip locks up. So again, some of those weird ass bugs people were having with Wi-Fi were due to the state stuff not being correctly locked and defined and the transmit path not being correctly locked and defined and then someone removing giant from all of this. So thanks guys. Um, now a bit of the details about what's going on under the hood. You know, packet transmission starts when the Ethernet layer hands the, 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 um, the WLAN, zip, WLAN X, the, the virtual AP interface, the VAP, a frame. And you get multiple processes all doing that at once. And there are a couple of paths that that can flow. It can go directly, IF transmit, get encapsulated, hard hand to the device, and then the hardware gets it. It can go transmit, and then, hey, wait a second, I need to put this on a queue because the node's asleep. Right? And sometimes there's management frames being leaked out the side using this raw interface that sometimes or sometimes it doesn't need 11, 802.11 encapsulation and encryption. And then that gets passed to the hardware. Now, on the other, the other cute thing which also bites you is sometimes when you receive a frame, for some odd reason, the TCP stack decides to transmit a frame when you've received one. Right? And so what, part of the great big locking fiasco in, in earlier FreeBSD versions is you can't hold locks when you're doing driver stuff and, and TCP and UDP stuff because receive causes transmit to occur in the, in the same, in the same uh, 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 call path. Right? It, doesn't, it doesn't do a deferred schedule or push it into a queue. It can actually pass it up to the, to the, it actually passes it up to the driver. So you can't just be naive and hold great big locks everywhere to serialize this because you get lock ordering issues and then your laptop locks up and all kinds of weird shit happens. So the problem there really, oh, and then what happens is the driver takes the frame and then queues all the, the, the driver specific 802.11 stuff that it may need to layer on top of it. And then it does crypto encapsulation because some cards do crypto encapsulation and some cards do hardware and some cards want to do it in software. And then it takes that entire mess and passes it into the relevant transmit queue to send off. Now, if you don't keep all of this stuff exactly in the same order as the VAP got it to do encapsulation, then you can end up passing stuff to hardware that's slightly out of sequence. And it only happens when you're doing a lot of traffic or you have a lot of sending threads. And so 
this wasn't obvious to me when I got handed this stuff because I thought it was just going to work. Yeah, when the hell does that happen? And, and so it only showed up when you're doing, say, 10 I concurrent iperf TCP sessions, or you start Chrome and it restores your session and it opens 100 TCP sockets. And it only, because it all, all the retransmissions that were happening in the TCP layer, I didn't notice the receive side dropping frames until I started looking at the access point stats on the receiver, and because we, we keep a lot of those, and noticing, hey, whenever I start Chrome, I get lots of drops. What the hell, right? And it boiled down to things being passed to the hardware in a slightly different order than the 802.11 stack got them in the first place. So, as I said, I've transmit doesn't do any kind of ordering or queuing. It leaves that up to the driver, which for 802.11 means that both the stack and the drivers themselves have to maintain the same packet order. So I have to make sure that I queue them into queues in the right order, and that when I, the driver calls its dispatch method to actually st grab stuff out of the IFnet queue or whatever queue it has if you're using IF transmit, that it actually just like, pulls them out and pu puts them in the harbor in the same order. So if you don't have correct queue handling and locking over your driver transmit path, you can get weird crap happening where you say, two concurrent threads try transmitting from the, I get called, let me start again. So you call at start, which will enqueue a frame and then um, call the transmit method to send it. So you have two things lock the queue, push it into the queue in the right order, and both thre threads have IF transmit call or IF start called. So you get two um, uh, separate threads calling at start, and both threads race to dequeue a frame. So sometimes, the, they'll, they'll race to DQ of the frame and first one win or the second one win, it, win. and they go, well, that doesn't really matter because whichever one DQs the frame first will finish transmitting first, right? But what happens in reality is if there's any kind of locking going on or an interrupt comes in on one particular CPU causing you know, that particular CPU's ath threat, so a transmit thread to block just a little longer than the other one, you get these subtle race conditions where the first one, D thread A, DQs a frame, Thread B DQs the second frame. An interrupt comes in on thread A's CPU. Thread B continues transmitting and wins the race to get it to the hardware, right? And then thread A comes back from handling some interrupt, continues running, but it, it, it pushes the first frame after the second frame, and the receiver drops it. That kind of subtle crap, right? So that's what I've been trying to fix, and it's a pain in the ass. So um, I've wrapped a great big lock around the transmit path, and Lock order issues happen, but it's good enough to debug the rest of it. What we're going to have to do is come up with, oh, and the way the Dragonfly BSD got around this is they just put a great big lock around the whole wireless infrastructure so they don't have to fix locking problems, which, no. And so, um, I'm, yes, but it won't. And I'll explain why in a minute, right? So um, for... Uh, fixing it, I'm, we're gonna ha I'm gonna have to implement, you know, what all the other 10 gigi drivers do, which is their IF transmit method sticks it into a ring buffer and then grabs a lock. And if it grabs the lock, it transmits. And if it doesn't grab the lock, it just leaves. And the or it, it, it schedules a deferred transmit task queue entry. And so the driver itself ensure, ensures that only one copy of the one instance of the driver transmit thread is running at once. So it enforces the, its own queue ordering. And it's kind of silly to have every you know, network driver have to implement the same kind of thing just to get around the semantics of IF transmit. So there is, I've started some discussions with a few people to try and come up with a better way of doing this so that we can do it once and then let network drivers and the 802.11 stack just reuse the same queue discipline and dispatch model. We'll see what happens. Um, and apparently Jeff, Jeff Robinson tells me that CAM has the same problems now. So, hey, cool, the same networking, turns out the networking and storage approaching the same kind of packet uh, uh, transaction speeds. It's kind of cool. Um, yes, and the other thing is that um, when handling transmit, there's all this extra state that people don't really realize is going on, mostly to do with power save and, 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 and queuing. So, you know, people seem to think Wi-Fi is this magical thing where crap works, but you know, imagine if you only had 10 base 2 and you needed to try and, you know, fight everyone else for the medium. It's, it's like that, right? It's a broadcast medium and one person gets to speak and if you collide, it's all bad. So, 
we need, I need to, as part of the whole transmit overhaul, push all of the, tra the, the queuing that we do for each station out of the driver and into the 802.11 layer so it knows you know, how many packets are queued to each one of these potentially hundreds of associated stations so we can make decisions about when to drop packets, um, when to communicate ENO buffs back up to the stack, right, to tell TCP to back the hell off, and when uh, allow the 802.11 layer to, uh, to hopefully better schedule packets in a, in a fairer way. Right? Um, hopefully someone else will get, be involved because this is useful for things like carriers and, and enterprise people building APs, but we'll see. Um, the other thing that people keep asking me about is background scanning. So background scanning is something that laptops do in the background to check to see if there are any other access points or to see if the access point signal levels have changed so that when you leave the room, it can immediately associate to a better access point rather than waiting until you just too far away to, to receive anything, and then having to go through the whole scan, check to see if there's something you can associate with, try associating, and blah, right? So for, if you want to be taken more seriously on laptops, you have to do this kind of thing. Otherwise, walking around this building is a pain in the ass. Um, the problem is, is we actually have background scan support in the wireless stack, but the driver needs to be a bit smarter. And I turned it off on the Atheros driver because 11N support requires that you don't drop frames at any point because it's like the, the, the aggregation stuff has a window, a transmit window the same as TCP AC sequence number, uh, AC and sequence number uh, windows work. And if when I change channel to do a background scan, I just flush the transmit and receive queues, then both ends get out of sync as to what they've currently seen and transmitted. So in order, instead of fixing it, I just turned it off because I'm going to eventually have to fix it. But fixing it means I have to do things like, when I go to change channel, take all the frames that are in my receive and transmit queue, stuff them somewhere else, do the background scan, and then put them back and then handle them. And uh, I didn't want to have to debug that just yet. But in order to do a lot of other interesting things, like support multi-stations, do P2P, I have to make that work. So this is high on my to-do list in the next year. Um, and the other thing is uh, people are really power conscious, and so we want the ability to be able to put the um, station card itself to sleep and then have it wake up automatically to, to check with the access point whether there's actually packets ready for it. Now, again, Net802.11 has all the infrastructure in place to do this, but for whatever reason, it was never implemented in the Atheros driver. And all the code in the hardware there is a code is there to turn the thing off and on again, but no one sat down and made it do that. And the reason I haven't done it is primarily because I looked at the Linux guys trying to get it work in Linux, and it still doesn't actually quite work well. Because it turns out that if you try writing to the hardware whilst you're turning it off, your laptop hangs. Because strange shit occurs like you try turning things off in the middle of a PCIe transaction, and who the hell knows what happens at that point, right? Dumb crap like that. And since I, I have a spectrum analyzer at home, but I don't have a PCI Express bus analyzer because I'm not crazy, like, I don't want to own one because they cost more than a house. So, no, right? Um, I want to get all of the, the current locking working correct. So when I do things like, like change channel, I know that I'm not transmitting and receiving at the same time. I know interrupts are disabled. I know I've turned off calibration so that when I do things like wake the, the nick up and put it to sleep, I have the infrastructure in place to know that the wireless card is actually not being spoken to. Otherwise, debugging this is like debugging it in Linux, where you get bugs like, I ran this for a day, and then suddenly shit didn't work, and Adrian mails the Linux wireless list saying, disable power save, and they're like, holy crap, the sun is out, everything is great. And that's where the debugging ends, right? I, I want to actually make it work and not just simply have it crap. So at some point I'll do it, but it's going to take some time. Um, and part of the, the other part of doing uh, station-side power save is the tra dynamic transmit power control, where if you're close by to the AP, like in here, why transmit at full power, right? And so I actually get, sat down with Sam's spectrum analyzer when I had my wisdom tooth pulled out of all times, because the spectrum analyzer was about four feet from my bed, right? And so I dragged it over and spent two days in bed hooked up to a spectrum analyzer deb debugging this, because I couldn't do anything else. Pardon? Oh, it, took, it stopped me. I was drugged, and it stopped me concentrating on how crappy I felt. So yes. Did drug help when you were No, but being, drug help, being drugged helped do things like 
figure out why when I write a transmit power of zero, the card is distorts instead of transmits at zero dBm. There were bugs like that to find, right? And little things like that. I have three more wisdom teeth to pull out. So I'm pretty sure <laughs> that there's, there's three more instances to do interesting crap, right? <laughs> anyway, so, 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 for, so for about four days, I sat down with a pile of varying age Atheros Nicks and tested dynamic power control on every one of them in order to figure out what the hell was going on. So now we actually have dynamic power control in FreeBSD working, but the wireless stack doesn't. There's nothing in the, the, the wireless stack knows how to do per node transmit power control, but nothing's taking advantage of it yet. But the driver does dynamic power control, and it works really quite well. I'm, I'm, I'm shocked that it actually works, because as I said, I was on drugs, and it was kind of funny. And the, the, one of the other things to try and get right in order for people to use this stuff um, at home, especially, is doing power safe support as an access point, which means when your device is asleep, you don't try transmitting anything to it. And when it wants to wake up and says, give me a frame, you give it exactly one frame, not two, and definitely not zero. Three stars. Sorry? <laughs> so um, again, Net802.11 had so has support for doing the legacy PowerSafe stuff, but the Atheros driver, I broke it when I made 11N work. So I decided to actually sit down and unbreak it. And the main reason it was spotty was if there's any frames queued in the wireless driver when the device comes along to say, have you got anything for me, you actually have to not only check the state of the wireless stack, but of the driver as well, which was not really done. So I made that work. And it was a pain in the ass, but I made it work. So now, when you're using a laptop or a mobile phone, you actually get decent performance when the phone is aggressively doing power save. Um, but there's lots of strict timing requirements because when your device wakes up and it says, give me a frame via a PS poll frame, you could have uh, like dozens of other devices trying to transmit. And so what you have to do is find a way to sneak that frame that you're responding really close to the top. Because what you don't want to have is 300 frames in the queue, right? And then the device stays awake for a few milliseconds. It goes, I haven't heard anything yet, so I'm going to go back to sleep again. And then the frame goes out, right? And there's nothing in the spec that really says how long it needs to stay awake for when it's doing this legacy power saving mode. So you have to be quite sneaky and only schedule enough frames to the hardware to keep it busy and no more, so that when events like PS Poll come along, when you poke a frame onto that queue, it goes out within a couple of milliseconds. Otherwise, as I said, weird shit happens. All right, so now we're the, what's, what's happening in the future? The reason you don't do global like, big giant locks around the wireless stack is because 11AC will bite you in the ass. Because they want to do one, two, and four million packets per second, and they want to get up to four gigabits per device. So don't do global locks in the wireless stack is the general answer here. The reason that you don't want to do global locks in the wireless stack is even though the device will go up and looks like a bit an Ethernet card and goes up to gigabits plus, there's still all of that 802.11 sta uh, state handling you have to do. So the last thing you want to do is grab a big giant lock while you're munging on, say, the power save queue. Right? The, the, the FreeBSD guys did a hell of a lot of work to unlock things specifically to be able to drive their cards easily at gigabit and, and gigabit plus. So we shouldn't repeat the same mistakes that they've fixed. Um, the interesting things in 11AC is it looks a lot like 11N, except they have much more dense encodings and they have uh, double and, and quadruple the channel width. So 160 megahertz channels will come soon. And the current stuff on the market is 80 megahertz wide, but they, they want to do 160 megahertz wide. The, um, they, the, they do, they want to do, at, at some point they're going to do multi-user MIMO. Sorry, someone say anything? No. They want to do multi-user MIMO, so they're actually transmitting to multiple clients at the same time, rather than one client at the same time. So they want to keep the air as busy as possible. The current generation stuff gets to almost a gigabit per second and easily breaks a million small packets per second on, on, one, on, one, on one NIC. And that's at 80 megahertz. When you do 160 megahertz, that doubles. When you do 160 megahertz with four streams instead of three, and they're all active, that doubles again. So things get a little bit crazy. Um, the last thing I want to do is have to fix lock contention again. So I'm not going to put a global lock around our wireless stack. What needs to happen? Somebody else needs to do the work is what needs to happen. Um, 
I am probably going to work on the, um, on the uh, regulatory related stuff and the wireless stack related stuff. So I have to do things like have the regulatory ha representation handle these new channel widths and, and channel setups. You have, to handle the, you have to handle the notion of the 11AC transmit configuration. So now it's not just a number. It's a number on how many streams and how, many, how wide the channel is. It's this combination thing, which like this, this three-dimensional, five-dimensional space that you have to represent. And at the moment, transmit rate is one number. And that's just not going to cut it. Um, there's all of this channel representation stuff where you still have to support legacy 11B and 11G channels. And then the 11N stuff gets laid on top of that. And then the 11AC stuff gets laid on top of that. Because when an 11AC client comes along, the first thing it does, it associates as a legacy client that it announces, by the way, I do 11N and 11AC. And then they negotiate 11N. And then they negotiate 11AC. Right? So you don't build an 11AC only device. It still has to support pretending that it does 11B and 11G and 11N. And th that's a little complicated, but it's n not that complicated. I can learn from the mistakes we went through at work. So I'll hopefully do a better job. Um, and there's also a whole bunch of new uh, information elements and negotiating VHT that is straightforward because it's in the specification, but I don't want to do it. Um, then someone has to port the driver. Now, the nice thing, the nice thing, is all the 11AC stuff runs firmware. Yes, I know. And so the drivers are pretty small. But on the flip side, it means that they run firmware. So we're not going to have this nice open source driver crap that's going on. But we've been starting to open source firmware anyway. So who the hell knows what's going to happen? Uh, officially, there is no plans for, for Theros to open up firmware for any of the, the 11AC chips. But we'll see what happens, right? They said that about the USB, and somehow we managed to open source the USB chip firmware. So hey, shit can happen, right? Um, but it does mean that porting the driver won't be the multi-year making it stable path that um, making the Theros driver stable has been. However, it will be that there's a multi-year path waiting for firmware updates from the vendor, which is anyone who's done wireless drivers with firmware knows who the hell knows how, how, how stable the firmware will be and when they'll stop supporting it. So, you know, this is just what happens with all the 11AC chips. I can't do anything about it. Um, but yes, the, 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 the infrastructure stuff that needs to change is it needs to start being as efficient as doing gigabit and multi-gigabit TCP, right? And with all the crazy crack locking that goes on there. And 11AD is kind of special because it's PCIe over Wi-Fi. And that's kind of frightening. And luckily, it's all done on the chip, right? I don't actually have to do it. I just have to negotiate 11 AD over 60 gig, and then this handoff magically happens, which is good, because I don't want to write PCIe code like that. That just scares the shit out of me. Um, there's a wireless driver for it in Linux, and they didn't have to do too much to get it working, because mainly it's making sure that your channel representation handles representing 60 gigahertz. Um, and then once that's done, it again, it associates as an 11N client with a bunch of information elements that say, oh, by the way, I do this magic crack. And then go, oh, that's cool. I do this magic crack too. And then suddenly it all happens. So the actual infrastructure in place isn't that bad. And someone needs to port the driver. And again, the, the driver is lots of firmware on a chip. So the driver itself shouldn't be that difficult. Um, I have no idea. Specifically, I've, sp I've, I've stayed away from the technical details so people can't claim that I've been tainted. But the idea is that people who build these PCIe devices, like these PCIe embedded like projectors and televisions, they'll implement their endpoint. And I don't know if they're going to have like an open thing where I can whack a PCIe NIC into something random. I don't know if they're going to do that. But as I said, you, you, negotiate, 11, you negotiate 11 AD, and then suddenly a PCIe device appears on your bus. And you go, hey, cool, you're a PCIe device. That's my understanding. I don't, don't want to go into any more detail I, at work, because you know, Qualcomm like patents. Oh, and we'll need hot plug PCIe to make this work. And uh, Gavin has been working on hot plug PCIe, so I'm happy. The next crazy thing is people, for some odd reason, use Bluetooth. You're all mad, OK? Bluetooth is a pain in the ass. Um, and for some odd reason, Apple have this thing where you can use Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, and suddenly your Bluetooth and Wi-Fi devices start doing this. Because Bluetooth 3 spec has this concept of having the Bluetooth 5 be on something other than Bluetooth. Now, strangely, the NetGraph framework and the Bluetooth framework you know, look really nice, because you could, in theory, plug a NetGraph Bluetooth module into some other thing to speak Bluetooth. Um, and if someone wanted to write that, I would be really happy. Um, because 
Apple and a bunch of our products do have this concept in the wireless stack of, you know, you negotiate, the, the Bluetooth stack negotiates that they also speak Wi-Fi and then they peel off individual Bluetooth socket connections over Wi-Fi transparently. If anyone wants to work on that, please come and see me because it's kind of awesome. But I don't want to be the guy that figures that crap out because I don't want to touch Bluetooth. It looks like a nightmare. Um, the other thing is Bluetooth coexistence, where your Bluetooth Wi-Fi NIC, your Bluetooth NIC and your Wi-Fi NIC don't stomp over each other all the time. And especially with the current generation hardware, where they put the Bluetooth NIC on the same die, using the same PA, the, the power amplifiers and the same antennas as the Wi-Fi NIC, the, 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 they have to do coexistence. And so a lot of the firmware devices do coexistence in firmware. If you want to do it on an Atheros device, I have all the register settings. Someone needs to write the coexistence code. I have all, I know how the hardware works, and I've actually written uh, some emails to the Linux developers list telling them how to do Bluetooth coexistence, but I don't want to do it. So again, if you want an interesting research project where I give you all of the register details and you go and figure out ways of doing Bluetooth coexistence that you implement from scratch, I'm very happy to help you. And the other, the, one of the last things that we don't do, which we actually need to do for specification compliance, is P2P, which is not for torrenting. It's for having your two, a station speak to another station without going through an AP. And this came about for things like streaming to televisions, where the last thing you want is your, your uh, television data stream to go through an access point that then retransmit it to, to, the, to the TV. Right? Because 11N is fast, but people have two gig access points and two gig sucks. So what they do with P2P is the stations announce that they support P2P and then they discover each other. They do a little bit of a chat and then they negotiate as if one ends at the, 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 the master is an access point and you're a slave. Right? And at the point where you've negotiated which one's the master and which one's the, the non-master, it looks like you're speaking to a host AP. Right? But I, we haven't got support for that. And again, I don't want to write it. But if people want to play with video streaming stuff to televisions that do P2P, this is the kind of stuff that we need. Now, there's a Linux implementation of P2P, and it's actually pretty simple to do. So if someone wants a, another, if, again, if someone wants a research project, this would be relatively easy to do. And basic P2P is, doesn't require driver modifications. The main difference here is there's P2P off-channel, where you negotiate a P2P session, but you say, hey, let's do our P2P data on a different channel. So say you, you speak 5 gig, and the television speaks 5 gig, but your access point speaks 2 gig. What can happen is you negotiate with the other guy, hey, let's go off to 5 gig and do our data exchange, but come back to 2 gig to be normal stations. Right? So even though the, the access point doesn't do 5 gig, your TV and your laptop can still speak at at fast rates on, on a clean 5 gig channel. And in order to make that work, I have to get all the background scan crap to work first so that I can do off-channel transmits and not screw up current data, current data flows. So I will, I'm going to do that anyway. But again, if someone gets P2P working, then they, they get this for free. So again, if you want to do P2P, please come and see me. And that's all that's, that's, all that's needed, as I said. Um, Sam did this cool hack with TDMA, and I made it work on 11N. Um, I need to get 11N aggregation working, and may, mainly get, getting 11N aggregation working over TDMA is an exercise in implementing some missing bits from the 802.11N spec that I then reuse for TDMA. Um, and the way that TDMA works is it, it works like TDMA. You, you both get transmit time slots, and then you both only transmit in that time slot. And there are no acts, right? So you don't actually get explicit acts as part of this, because to act a frame, you have to do it shortly after you transmitted it. But the 11N spec, gives you this ability to delay sending your ACK until some un un uh, uh, undefined period in the future. So what I plan on doing here is implementing the delayed block ACK support, where you transmit a bunch of frames, and then you explicitly ask the other end, tell me what you got. And then the other end sends you back the response. And you can do that milliseconds later. So the plan for TDMA is to implement that as a generic thing in Net802.11 to support as a normal 11N thing. And then when doing TDMA, you just turn that on. And so I'll transmit a whole bunch of crap, and then the last frame I transmit is a, is a solicitation to send a block hack, and then the remote end will transmit its crap and then send me a block hack. And then I know what that got, and I can retransmit what it didn't get. And suddenly I get fast TDMA for free. Now that's the theory. If it works in practice, great. If it doesn't work in practice, I have three wisdom teeth left. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, uh, Montadar's been working on Mesh. 
So once we get, um, once he finishes the, some of, once we finish some of the transmit changes off, we'll get 11N for free. So I'm looking forward to getting 11N and PowerSafe support in Mesh for free. Um, and he's working on trying to get interoperability with 11S. I'm hoping that at some point, when, if I ever get enough spare time and I make background scan work, we can support the concept of having one NIC be multiple stations. Because the minute I can exist on multiple stations at once, I can actually you know, speak to an access point on, station, on channel one, and then say, I'm going to sleep, and then go speak to an access point on channel 100, and then say, I'm going to sleep, and, and switch between them. And that lets you do interesting things with mesh, where you could actually say to the network, I'm going to sleep, and then go speak to another set of mesh nodes on another channel. And again, once I get background, scan background scanning and, and off-channel working, I get that crap for free. So I'm hoping that happens. So I may have given you the impression there's a lot to do. Um, the question that people say is, well, do we really need all of that? And the problem is, is that, you know, depending upon what kind of device or use case you have, you need a slightly but not quite overlapping set of things. So for people who are running access points, they need PSPOL and US, UAPSD, which are the power save, uh, the power save uh, uh, packet exchange stuff, and they need QoS and they need RAID control. The laptop people need their laptops to chew less power. So they don't really care about QoS to multiple devices because there's only one device they're speaking to, but they need to support power save and they need to do background scanning and they need to do re-authentication and fast re-authentication, right, and roaming. The mesh people need all of that, which is fine because he's cool. And the developers need much better diagnostic and inspection tools, which means I have to add them to the stack and that you know, takes time. So the problem is in order to actually try and meet everyone's needs, I have to do all of this work that doesn't quite overlap what everyone else needs. And in the way it works in Linux, it's different companies with different needs contribute the, the changes to the wireless layer based on what they need. So Google's contributions are mostly Chromebooks as stations make this shit not suck. And the Theros's contributions are mostly make the AP side not suck. And then Intel's stuff is like, well, our NICs need some help, and we want to do Bluetooth. So we, we add these little extensions to do that, right? So every, every vendor jumps in and implements their own little bit, and they try to you know, not fight each other too much. But with us, we are in the enviable, posi enviable position where there's only me. So I get to make the call as to what's important and what's not. So hopefully, um, I'll get some time to get a lot of this stuff done. But as I said, it's going to take time. And if people want to see um, uh, FreeBSD appear in, in vendors, in vendor supplied laptops and tablets and whatnot, a lot of this stuff has to happen. Because if you go to a vendor like HP or Dell and they want to run, and you say we want to run blah on their, or sell blah on their FreeBSD on their blah, they're going to have a checklist of things. And their checklist is going to have everything on that list and more. And Linux has that on the checklist, but a lot of it's buggy. But it's on the checklist, so they win, and we don't. So if people would like to see this stuff become, uh, you know, appear in more devices, then this is the kind of crap that we have to make work. Questions? I'm not lying when I say 11AC does a gigabit. I've actually seen it at work. It's kind of amusing. It's just you wave your hands in front of it and it will, all shit breaks loose. But it actually does a gigabit. <laughs> Oh, good. Um, thank you for everyone who lets me complain on the, on, on the IRC channel and not um, and, uh, put up with me, because I know I vent a bit. But there's a lot of stuff that needs to be fixed. And, uh, and thanks to Hobnob and Qualcomm for uh, giving me toys and money, because toys and money are kind of fun. Thank you. <laughs>